Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a CastBox original produced in partnership with our friends at Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and all of your favorite podcasts are there, ripe for the downloading. Sacred Symbols is available wherever you get your podcasts, of course, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot. We think it's pretty rad. To get each episode of Sacred Symbols three days before the public, completely ad-free, please consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Perks for support include not only getting the show early and ad-free, but you can also gain access to monthly exclusive podcasts, and supporting on Patreon is the only way to get your listener mail read on the air, and much more. Plus, supporting Sacred Symbols on Patreon also nets you perks for other Collins Last Stand shows automatically, including the Nostalgia and Retro Podcast Knockback, the YouTube series dedicated to gaming called SideQuest, and the eclectic interview podcast Fireside Chats. Thank you for your generosity, kindness, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and all things Collins Last Stand would not exist. But enough of that. On to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 40. That's 4040. Wow. My name is Kama. It's very exciting. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by global traveler Chris Raygun, who just came back from Boston. Yeah. My old stomping grounds. Did you enjoy yourself at it PAX It was East? fine. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of go to these cons just because I really like to catch up with friends who I don't really get to see all that often, especially mm. on the East Coast. Uh, so it was really kind of just a big excuse to do that. The con itself was cool. I saw a lot of like weird looking games. Uh, none of the big ones that I wanted to see. I couldn't play. I couldn't play. No, I couldn't play Crash Team Racing because they have this weird PlayStation Experience app that you need to download and schedule. And I was like, ah, it's kind of clever for people that don't know. I wouldn't want to do it either. But for people that don't know, you can download this app that then allows you to make time slots, so you don't have to wait online at these conventions. I don't know if other publishers do this, but Sony does this. And uh, I never had to deal with it because I always had a press pass. Yeah. So that is kind of lame, but it is nice in the sense that I think they used to do this at PSX too. That way you can kind of like, you know, go around and, you know, buy, buy, buy and spend, spend, spend and hype, hype, hype and whatever it is you do with these conventions. So <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it is it is nice. But I remember they, they opened reservations at like 1 p.m. You can reserve these time slots. And I checked in 1 p.m. and they were all full instantaneously. And I was like, all right, well, can you imagine the nerds it. that are watching this thing? It, it reminds me of the first PSX in 2014. That was when they released the 20th anniversary PS4. Yeah. And it was during the show. So people were just like like all on their phones trying to secure this thing as opposed to enjoying the show itself. It just blew my mind because like they had three demos available for the PlayStation Experience demos at PAX East. And it was was Crash Team Racing, uh, Remedies Control, and Mortal Kombat 11. And Crash Team Racing filled up before either of those two things. Those are the, the other two. It's interesting. Well, if the and I was sales, like, what the hell is the demand for this? Are you serious? I mean, the demand was, listen, way higher for Crash Bandicoot, Insanity, whatever the fuck they called it. What was that called? The the trilogy? The insane trilogy. The insane trilogy. Colin, you cultureless ass. Yeah, I know you're slag. I know you're mad about it. But <laughs> I remember when they announced that, I was very open, being like, who is this for? I really was of the belief that Crash Bandicoot was irrelevant. Like that there's a group of loud people. You see this a lot, right? Yeah, In yeah. games. Like, we got Mirror's Edge 2, which maybe sold like two hundred thousand copies. You know what I mean? So when Crash Bandicoot was everyone was excited about it, I'm like, there's no way anyone cares about this and then it was really a huge game i think it sold like eight or ten million copies which is huge and so of course there's demand for the crash team racing so i'm just kind of removing myself from yeah. any sort of commentary i just kind of it. always assume that i was one of the very few people who actually really enjoyed that game because that's my favorite crash bandicoot game and it's a racing spinoff you know what i mean i feel like it's a heresy opinion if you if you're a crash guy i don't know i don't know what the community for crash looks like <laughs> I know. it should be a heresy if you are a crash guy it's almost as bad as being a sonic guy right <laughs> no it's not, not it's not nearly as bad it's an echelon above but still yeah. you guys are brothers you know what i mean <laughs> distant cousins maybe but you enjoyed boston you had a nice time i saw i was following your ex- escapades of via the instagrams and yeah. what have you. you use your instagram story quite a bit you're one of the only stories that i watch on instagram i, I bunty keeps getting on my case to use it more so more. i've been trying to yes because I, I don't use it lot. all that often. Like, there are, like, sometimes some weeks where I just don't use it. And then Bunty's like, you should do it. It helps. And I'm like, okay. And I figure I'll just do it when I'm doing actually interesting things. I'm afraid that if I ever use it, that I'll accidentally, like, post a picture of my dick or something like that. <laughs> accidentally? Or, you know, yeah. You know? <laughs> you never know what happens. At least there's multiple steps for me to go through before I get a picture on Instagram. Yeah. By the way, you can follow us both on Instagram if you so desire. But I'm glad to have you back, Chris. Welcome back. 
PAX Prime is a, the next conference that or convention that I want to aim to go to in Seattle. That's later this year. I'd like to do Sacred Symbols live. And I wanted to actually do this in PAX East. You know, I lived in Boston for a long time. I'd much rather go to that show. But we'll see if we can get it done this time. That was my fault because it just kind of. We had a meetup there and a lot of people came from Sacred Symbols. And that, that, was, really, cool. that was really awesome. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's was, exciting. Yeah, it was, it was super cool. It was like this convergence of two audiences. Did they fight? Nah, no, oh, no fighting. Bad. Let them fight. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said that and then walk, like walked really slowly and dramatically away. Now, PAX East is over, but the fun just begins now because we're recording this on April Fool's. This won't go up on April Fool's, but there will be no joking. I hate uh, April Fool's. I do, too. And, and, you know, I have to say, and I still have an incredible amount of love and respect for the company I came from, but IGN is a big reason why April Fool's sucks. <laughs> Did you see their thing today? No, I don't even because I don't even care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> for, for people that are curious why I say that in the gaming industry, it's like we used to put in enormous amounts of production and money into our April Fool's jokes beginning in 2008 with the what people might remember, the Legend of Zelda movie trailer, which looking back on it doesn't look real at all. But it really surprised people and people thought it was real. We got like letters, like people, kids crying, parents upset. So then we started doing like those kinds of videos every year. We did one. What is it? What was it called? Like the augers or something, whatever the, the wizard detectives in Harry Potter are. We did a pretend one as if that was going to become like a buddy cop show or something like that. And yeah, I kind of feel like IGN is kind of the nexus of why April Fool's <laughs> sucks in the video game industry. But I will say this, that I had an amazing idea when I was there my last year and I wish they did it, but they didn't. It would have been too hard and too much work, but I think people would have really respected it, which is I wanted to reskin all of IGN as if it was 1990. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. And then replace like on the top header, like NES, Master System, all this kind of stuff. And then really write like a bunch of stories. So the entire site is populated with like maybe reviews and videos like it would take time and effort. And then yeah. you'd be able to click something to just get to the real site. But they never wanted to do anything like really, really deep like that. I'm like, everyone expects your fake video. Let's do something else. Yeah, they did a fake Nintendo Direct where they were like every Zelda game's coming and Tinder's coming and, you know, it, I don't know. TurboTax, I think, was on there, right? TurboTax. Like which is, it's cute, but I, I, they're owning it now. Like, back in the day, it used to be like we would never say if it was real or fake. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, this I, was pretty obviously fake, yeah. but, like, still. It was it was a little annoying. <laughs> I just, I don't like April Fool's either. The internet kind of ruined it. I don't know if you remember, but April Fool's back, like, in the analog days was, was like, a little different. Like, you didn't really know yeah, what yeah. was going to happen. Well, also, you know? I feel like just the internet in general is entirely ironic and constantly joking all the time anyway. I see memes and like fake video game box art like probably every day now because it's just a hobby for people on right. the internet. Whereas before it really wasn't that common at all. Right. So now it just feels like a day that everybody celebrates the fact that they lie even though they lie all the time constantly forever. Yeah, exactly. It feels weird. Who doesn't lie on the internet? <laughs> Dustin Furman wrote into us on Patreon. And by the way, this show is supported on Patreon, patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. You can support us over there if you want to get the show three days early and ad free. This also goes for my other shows. You can submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas, exclusive podcasts, etc. March, by the way, one of the biggest months, actually the biggest month on Patreon for Collins Last Stand since around launch two years ago. So That's we wild. really do appreciate you guys. And thank you for that. But Dustin Furman wrote into us and Dustin is actually Dustin has some fucking audacity oh, because yeah? he is the editor of Collins Last Stand's podcast. He edits Knockback and Fireside Chat. <laughs> and he put a question and he, and he submitted a question. He said, why is Colin too scared to do the Kingdom Hearts three? Let's play now. Dustin, what did I first of all tell you about that lip? Right. <laughs> what did I tell you about that? But the second thing that I wanted to say was that we're going to record a Let's Play after we record this podcast today. Yeah. We're going to do Bloodborne first. Bloodborne won last month in the election. The month on For people that don't know, on Patreon, our Patreon supporters vote on what games we'll do a Let's Play on each month. And they voted on Kingdom Hearts 3 two months ago. And then last month, they voted on Bloodborne. We're going to deliver Bloodborne first. We're going to deliver it this week. The reason that is, Dustin, is I'm not, I'm not scared of it. I'm certainly concerned about it. <laughs> yeah. But I don't want to say I'm scared about it. But I realize that we don't have an audio solution that allows us to hear the audio without it bleeding through the mics. Typically, we play games where we can just read the text or we don't have to hear it. And if you plug headphones into the controller, then it tells the PS4 not to send audio to the laptop and so on and so forth. So it's a big thing for me. I'm really stupid with technology, so I need to figure that out. So we'll do that next. I promise. I promise you it's coming. That's also not on you. That's, that's, that's just a dumb design on the PS4's part, too, because that's not a problem on the Xbox One or, at all. So it's, it's weird to me that it's not a setting that you can flip. It might be, but I just don't know it's about not. it. It's not. I've looked okay. into it. I've tried to stream stuff on, on PS4 and it's just like, oh, well, I, I, I can't I can't hear it. So I'll have to swap consoles. It's ridiculous. Because when Aaron and I did a way out, 
Let's Play like last year, I thought it was really clever, like recording it with headphones plugged into it. And then we got it back and there was no sound. Like, fuck. Yeah. We have to do it again. It's because, super frustrating yeah. when you find that out. So, yeah, we have to figure out a solution to that because that's a game we need to hear. Yeah. Right. And laugh about. But we can't it can't be heard audibly through the mics. So and, and I've been researching yeah. the lore so I can oh, educate you. Man. So, as yeah. we play. So Bloodborne is going to be fun. By the time you hear this, it will be a, on free feeds. It'll be up already. A few years ago, I made a really popular video where I made a horrendous Bloodborne character like the wor I named him Galvatron and it was like the worst possible character ever. And I want to make an even worse character. I want to see what depths of insanity we can get to on those sliders. I'm excited. And Dark, then Soul, we'll Dark Souls and like Bloodborne custom characters are like always, always hideous. Did you see my character in The Division 2? No. Did I show you the character in The Division 2? I have a picture of him here on my phone now this is an audio podcast so i don't know how useful this will be to you actually is it it's on instagram that will be the easiest place for me to find it this is my uh this is my character <laughs> what, what is that he looks like is, is that a mustache yeah he so to describe him to you guys he has his eyes are squeezed together in the center of his face <laughs> he has like a massive like bulbous nose and then like a mustache like a porn star mustache a scar under his lip and guy he, fieri hair like yeah spiky, he has like spiked, hair. spiked almost like an Italian or Jufro, but it's blonde. And then he has massive ears and he's reporting for duty. This is the man running around Washington, D.C. right now. I don't like that. I don't like what I just saw. I can only see his back. So I always like thinking when I'm fighting the enemy. <laughs> that's the last thing they see. That's the last face that they ever see before they go down. Now, Chris, sometimes we take a little while to get into the show. Sometimes we get right into it. I do want to take a few moments to address a few things. OK, last week you and I talked about Sekiro or Sekiro, however you want to say. Yeah. And I criticized from software for making the same kind of games for different publishers. And this got people pretty upset with me. Now, typically people get upset about things and I don't really care. It's like you, you got to kind of just take it. People get upset right, about right. everything. But this is one of those things where I'm like, what did I say? Like, I must what have people, said what something. What were people saying that you said? People were just saying like, you know, uh, Colin hates Sekiro and he doesn't understand these games. And I was hoping to get some insight and he's wrong. And he likes the same Mega Man games and he wants Castlevania. every. And I'm like. You guys are not hearing anything that I'm saying. So I actually went for the first time in Sacred Symbols history. I went back and listened to it, like listen to the oh, wow. segment. You know, I do edit the show, so I hear it all. But I went back and listened to it. And I'm like, there must be something in here that I said. And I listened to the whole segment and I didn't say anything. In fact, like I said, like, I'm so stoked people are enjoying the game. It's great yeah. that people like this game. I'm really excited to play it. But what I criticize, and I think this is the confusion for people, I criticize from software making very similar games for different publishers. And I right. challenge people to think of another scenario where a studio is making the same game with minor differences in four different franchises for three different publishers. Well, I think the the, That's it. the issue that people are taking is that you're calling them the same game. And Bloodborne and Sekiro are very, if you play them, they're not really similar at all. The, the challenge is the same, the level kind of like the general idea, I guess the blood of it is kind of similar, but they play very differently. Well, I haven't played it yet. So as I said during that, I also said I'm speaking out of turn. I've not played the game oh, yet. Oh, well, there you go. Then you're covered. But the only developer that I could think about that is similar in this respect, well, I, thought, you... I thought about it, Omega Force. Omega Force. Omega Force is a Tecmo Koei owned studio in Japan that makes the Musou games. So they make Dynasty Warriors and all of Samurai Warriors and all oh, those right. spinoffs. They make the same game over and over and over again with minor differences for the same publisher. So I just wanted to be clear about that. If you like Sekiro, that's ex I think it looks great. And Chris is telling me that I'm wrong, that these games aren't similar. And a lot of you have said that as well. But I wasn't criticizing their ability to make the games or the quality of games. I'm simply saying that their publisher relationships are weird. I'm excited about it. It's just a game. Well, let's save it because we'll talk yeah, about we'll it. Yeah, we'll save it. Yeah. The other things I wanted to get through, Chris, was uh, merch. This is something that people have been asking a lot about. As I've said ad nauseum on this show, I wanted to find a solution that gave us American merchandise. I know we have a global audience, but I always speak about American jobs and industry in America. All of that. This was my chance to, in a small way, contribute to American jobs and Amer American manufacturing. So I found an, uh, a solution that is all sourced and printed and shipped from America. I have the contract waiting for the, the samples and then we'll go. So the ball is in play. I think the ball cool. is in play. We might have news on this in the coming weeks and I'll have that information for you as soon as possible. I know a lot of you are eager about Sacred Symbols merch and other Collins Last Stand merch. Alex Grisby wrote into us, Chris, on Grisby. Patreon. Grisby. Grisby. Sounds like a comic sorry, book Grigsby. name. Grigsby. Oh, Grigsby. That's, That's even more good. comic booky. Says, hey, Colin and Chris, I know you tend to stay away from rumors and such, but did you see the pictures of the PlayStation controller that have been circulating? Tidex shared it. Tidex, of course, is a well-known insider. I, I know I, we speak privately sometimes, and he seems to have been right on many rumors in the past. Any chance that it's a PS5 controller? So 
No, that that controller. Did you see this thing? It no, looked I'm very looking compelling. It, up now. it was basically a, a DualShock like a DualShock Four light controller, a little more bulbous, and where the touchscreen is is like a screen, like a real screen that had like a display on it, which looked pretty cool. Like, I'm I like oh. actually, this doesn't look too ridiculous. And it came like along with a dev kit and stuff like that. But apparently, this controller isn't real, and I can't confirm it with any. I haven't really tried to talk to many people, but I've not confirmed this. So maybe it's real, but it doesn't seem like it's real. And I think Tidex himself might have tweeted out that it's fake. But I don't know. It's April Fool's when he tweeted this out. So right. is it a, you know what I mean? Uh, so I don't know if it's real or not, but I'm not reporting on that because I just don't have any information. But it looks cool. I don't think it looks bad at all. No. I think it looks relatively realistic. I think the D-pad looks a little weird. And finally, before we get into what we're playing, Chris, Azan wrote into us on Patreon and said a challenge slash bet. For Chris Raygun. Okay. If Chris manages to get Crash Team Racing Platinum Trophy within one week from its release. Okay. By the 28th of June, I will personally get him a PlayStation 5 from Amazon <laughs> to be shipped to CLS's address. I promise I will buy him the console before getting it for myself. That's how confident I am that those CTR online trophies will be such a pain in the butt for everybody. One more thing. No cheating, gentlemen. No early access. Challenge starts from 21st of June. Official release date till the 28th of June. One week only. No, I, I refuse. Because I can get a PS5 on my own. I don't need you guys to buy me a PS5. T tell you what I'll do. If I don't get the Platinum in one week, I will buy you a PS5. Whoa. I'm that confident. It's the reverse. I swear to, I swear to God. It's the reverse deal. This is unprecedented. Yeah. Okay, so Azan. I'm on record by uh, saying this, by the way. This is the record. Note it. Uh, our stenographer here in the room will note it into the record. Just waiting on that. Thank you. Now, <laughs> Azan, Chris is going to buy you a PS5. Now, there's a little bit of a nebulous nature with this, though. Because we'll probably get this game early. Right. And you're probably going to start earning trophies, even if they don't sync before. They're going to be timestamped before that date. I'll start on the day. I'll start on launch. I don't believe you. I mean, I, why would you do that? For what I'm bet. saying is that. I'm the, a betting man. I like betting. What I'm I saying, have a problem, Colin. But, the, but this is what I'm saying. The bet can start from, 20, or from one week, seven days from the first trophy that you earn until the end, right? Like, cause I guess so. That would, I'm just saying the bet can still be maintained. Maintain. I'll give a one week game. time frame. I can't be from release, I guess, if we're getting it early. Right. We don't know if that's true or not. But so. All right. The ball's in play. Little did you know, Azan, when you wrote in that you would be getting a gift. <laughs> perhaps. Tricked you. And I think Azan lives in like Oman or something like that. So you're going to have to uh, ship uh, it to the Middle East. Oh, OK. Well, that's... well, you probably buy him one and just have it shipped. Yeah, I'll just do that. <laughs> all right, Chris, let's talk about what we're playing here in your category. We have a little document, of course, that we use. You have noted that you're still just playing Sekiro, but you were also gone. Yeah, I was I was gone. I didn't really have a chance to play really much of anything. I played a little bit of Hollow Knight on the Switch that I brought, but I didn't really have much time to really do anything other than Sekiro before I was leaving. Uh, I still love it. I think it's great. As of right now, I think it's probably my game of the year. So far, it's pretty early in the year to say that. But, right. you know, as of right now, everything that's come out. Until Days Gone comes out. Until Days Gone comes out, until <laughs> Crash Team Racing, <laughs> Crash Team Racing is my game of the year. That'd be a joke, but I love it. I think it's a, a solid evolution of uh, the general kind of from software kind of design philosophy. I think it's fun. I think it's challenging. I think it's a lot more focused. It's a lot more polished. It doesn't feel as buggy as like Dark Souls One did. It doesn't feel as punishingly unfair as Dark Souls One, but it it still feels like it's actually teaching you. It, it doesn't feel like a joke. Mm. Dark Souls fair. One to me felt like a joke. Interesting. I don't know. Like swinging your sword and hitting the wall when you were trying to hit enemies and then enemies just pretending like the, the walls just don't exist for them. and They're just swinging their swords through rooms and it's like, oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. They don't play it's, by the same rules. Yeah. It's none of that. It's it's entirely fair. Every time I die, I've never been like, oh, bullshit. It's always been like, shit, I shouldn't have done that. It sounds like the game needs to be played aggressively, which which sounds really exciting to me. Bloodborne started to go down that road a little bit with the gun and you can control crowds and like decide who you alert. It's really cool. cool. I love it. I'm looking forward to playing it. It's still on my little cross media bar. Maybe I'll jump into it this week. I just know from my past experience with From Games, I can't play it at the same time I'm playing other games. It needs to be like my life while yeah. I play it because otherwise I'm just not going to stay sharp enough. Yeah. I and so I'm mean. really just trying to clear out everything else. I think it's going to be a game I'll probably get to in the summer because we're going to get, I mean, we're in April now. We're going to get Days Gone soon and then we're going to have to move on to other stuff. And, and, you know, I don't know. So I'm looking forward to playing it. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And I'm really pleased that a lot of other people are enjoying it. You're not the only person I've heard that has referred to it as their game of the year so far. So I'm still playing God Wars. I recommend it. Someone actually tweeted me a picture of them buying it on Vita, which is great. I, I was saw that. Yeah. I was alerted that it's also on Switch, so you can play it there. I platinum the Messenger. That was my 83rd Platinums. And I really do highly recommend that game. Uh, I recommended it last week, too. And the Division 2, I'm still playing. I think I leveled, I'm like level 18 now. I'm starting to like sync a little bit more with that game, playing it in a greater way. I was talking a little bit with people online, and I think I've identified my major problem with The Division, which is 
it's really hard and I like hard games. So I'm looking for these, you know, the, this experience that's difficult, but also fair in the way that it puts you back into the world. And so the Division 2 is really pretty ruthless compared to the first game. But my problem with it is I only want to play it for an hour or two because when I die, then I get booted back to this other thing. Yeah. The, the, the game doesn't remember unless you're in a mission or a side mission that you were doing something. And that really is a bad design philosophy. Like if I'm trying to take a like a control point over, it should remember that that's what I was doing and put me back near that area when I spawn. You know, yeah, like, that, that is one thing that's kind of annoying about it. I know Destiny doesn't have that problem, really. Destiny tends to revive you pretty close to wherever the hell you were because they figure you're probably doing something out in the world. I like The Division 2 a lot, actually, but that is kind of an annoying thing. I haven't played it just because Sekiro has been abducting my time. Yeah, I'm, I'm digging The Division 2. That's like my really my main point with it is like yeah. there should be a penalty for dying. And you should not want to. There are games where there's no real penalty and that's stupid. And games are becoming more forgiving in that way. But there's also this thing about like if you're trying to penetrate deep into a territory, you haven't really unlocked any save points or whatever. Like it, it doesn't the game doesn't really encourage that. It penalizes you so severely, especially with the load screens and stuff. So my only thing is, is that I wish they would just fix that. That could probably be fixed in a patch even because yeah. the game creates arbitrary checkpoints during missions and side missions. And it just places if you die during a firefight, you just get placed right before the firefight. And you try again. So why can't they just program in that nature of these dynamic events that are happening in the world as well? But otherwise, I'm really digging it. I think it's really fun. Uh, but the game that I want to talk about this week in a somewhat deep way is the game Generation Zero. OK, so, yeah, you've this have game you fucking it? sucks. Oh, no. Now. <laughs> oh, no. I bought it straight up. Like before it even came out, this I is avalanche, it. Right? This is an avalanche game on uh, their Apex open world engine. And it's just really bad. Now, it's a disappointment because I've only played it for a couple hours. I couldn't even take anymore. And I want to like these games. The game is really interesting. It takes place in Sweden in the late 80s. Okay. And what it's basically about is that these kids go away. These teen kids are like go away to some archipelago like vacation spot for a little while and they come back and everyone's dead. And there are machines like roaming around and there's some alternate history with World War II that's relevant and stuff like that in there. And what's interesting is that the game starts with no cutscenes, no voice acting, no characters. And originally I'm like, oh, that's really low budget. And maybe it is, but it starts with this black screen, the scroll where it explains some stuff. And it reminds me a lot of Red Dawn. So because people might remember the movie Red Dawn from the 80s starts with like these black splash screens that explain what happened. And then it just goes right into the movie. There's like no cute music intro yeah, and shit yeah. like that. But then I realized, like, in my couple hours, like, I have not run into anybody. I have not heard one snippet of voice acting. There are no cutscenes, And I like that mysterious nature, but it feels so low budget. Yeah. And the thing that encapsulates it for me is that I was walking up this coast and it's really empty. It reminds me of Mad Max, which was also by Avalanche, where it's really empty. But Avalanche, I think, made Mad Max empty by design. And there's this like little hut in the like far in the distance. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like there's a hut for me to explore. That's exciting. So I'm like walking, walking, walking. And I go up to the hut. And you can't even enter it. It's just like a piece of geometry on the map. I'm oh. like, you have to be fucking kidding me. You know? <laughs> and it's the only thing of It's note like the only on thing the you can even see like anywhere around you. And when I got to, I'm like, you have got to be, there's not even like a door. You can't even go in and get any items. The inventory system is awful, awful. Oh no. It's like a Resident Evil type, type inventory system where like things take up room. Yeah. As opposed to like wait. And the combat is just janky and you die so easily. It's I heard, just really I heard that good. there's like stealth in it, but the robots or whatever see you from like way far away. Yeah, they see you and they stick with you, too. So, you know, like the little half, like the radial that appears in like a Far Cry game. Yeah. Where you see an enemy and then it shrinks or grows like those things happen in this game. But like they just stay like once a robot almost sees you, like it almost just stays that way until it finally. And then a thing pops up being like you're in combat. Oh, wow. And it's like, oh, man, I've only fought one type of enemy. Is it a, So it's like a survival game. Kind yeah, of. it's an open world survival game. And there's something cool at the heart of it. From a design perspective, I feel like they went, listen, we want to make a game. It's going to be low budget, $40. We don't have room for any cutscenes and voice acting and stuff. So what can you guys do with that? And they're all like, well, let's make a vacant open world in Sweden. And I don't mean vacant as a derogatory word. Like, let's make it real. Like, there's not something to find ever. ever. You have to really explore. And maybe that was like the idea, but it's just it's just bad. You know, like and, and it's one of those things where people were telling me it was bad and I was reading the reviews as like a three on Metacritic or something like that. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, no way. Avalanche is Avalanche can't make a game that bad. I'm not a huge Just Cause fan or anything, but yeah, no good. No bueno. Oh, that's a Stay shame. far away from Generation Zero. Chris, we have a few questions from the audience before we get into the news All right. regarding these kinds of things here. 
Thomas Hewitt said, hello there, Comely Colin and Crass Chris. Mm -hmm. Colin, last week you mentioned you were interested in playing Generation Zero, the new under the radar avalanche game. Have you had a chance to play it yet? And so what are your thoughts? Well, I just gave it. He says, I played about 10 hours of it solo and really enjoy it, though it definitely is a mixed bag. The sound design is incredible and the guns all pack a meaty punch and the eerie sense that the world has been left suddenly and mysteriously devoid of human life creates such a heavy atmosphere that only the division, particularly the original, can match in recent memory. I wanted to re read Thomas's comment because there is another side to the coin, I guess. Yeah. I have no problem with anything in the game except for playing it. And when that's when, and when that's and when that's true, that's a problem, right? Yeah, everybody has uh, different, you know, bullshit levels that they're willing to tolerate. I feel like Sekiro is kind of like that too, where it's like, ah, I, I, if I played Sekiro like maybe six years ago, I probably would have been like, no, nope, it's too hard, I give up. <laughs> well, speaking of Sekiro, Parker Cook wrote into us, Chris. He says, "Hey, C squared, Sekiro has been the toughest game I've ever played. I've never tried Dark Souls or Bloodborne, and it's really kicking my ass, but I'm loving it." After beating the first few bosses and having a few others spoiled for me, I have a weird feeling when I start thinking about playing the rest of the game. I wouldn't call it dread per se, but while I'm really enjoying the in-moment gameplay, I can't help but almost feel nervous for the things to come. <laughs> Has a video game ever made you feel an emotion that you thought you'd never experience playing a game? Thanks for all of the great content and commentary. Thank you, Parker, for the thoughtful inquiry. Do you feel that way playing Sekiro? Because I really felt that way playing Bloodborne, this feeling of dread of overcoming and then taking a breath and then realizing you don't even know what lies ahead yet. And there's all this shit you have to deal with. It's very those games create that. I feel like atmosphere. It's, I feel like I have the opposite where like in the moment when I'm fighting, I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I almost want to like, just like shut it off. And then I actually beat the boss and then it, it feels amazing. Uh, I don't feel any sense of dread. I feel, I, I'm just I'm excited to get to the next thing. It's, it's a really exciting game just because the combat is so involved. It doesn't feel like dodge, you know, hit dodge it feels act actually like parry like there's actual like you really got to be in time with the game it's it's kind of a rhythm game in a weird way oh in that way it Where sounds you... cool again i'm excited to play it i'm stoked other people are enjoying it i feel like i'm gonna get a similar feeling that he did that i understand what he's saying that feeling of yeah. dread in the sense that like i felt that in neo i felt that in bloodborne and you and I, I imagine i'll have a similar feeling with sekiro the he asked about other emotions i don't know if anything comes to you chris what comes up for me though is uh the emotion of real sadness when I played Journey for the first time and the only time I played it, I, I cried during the game. I didn't expect a video game to really do that to me. So it's yeah. nice to feel emotion. It's when, nice to feel. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> we say that a joke and it is. Yeah, like we are so, you know, fucking sardonic on the show. <laughs> but I want to feel like an emotion, you know, like, oh, this is thrilling or this is yeah, sad yeah. or I, I feel for this character. But really, I'm, I like just playing video games. Yeah. But when a video game can also accompany a gameplay experience with some sort of feeling whatever it is i think that's really exciting and games are being able to do that more and more often intrigue or interest is yeah. what I, I carry with me a good example of that was like when i played tacoma you know i'm very interested in what happened here so it's it's exciting yeah now i feel like the last of us was a lot of it was a big thing for a lot of people I, I feel like a lot of people probably connected with that story in a way that probably people didn't really connect with video game stories before mm. but i know bioshock one I, I felt a sincere feeling of just like having everything pulled out from under me when i finished bioshock and i never i don't think i've ever had that again Closest was Bioshock Infinite. Bioshock 1 was like wild to experience. I wish I could play that game again for the first time. That'd be so amazing. Me too. It is one of those games. The Last of Us is another one of them where you can just wipe your mind. I've been meaning to get back to The Last of Us and I might do that this year because I want to platinum it on PS3. I have all the hardest trophies on PS3. I just never like the online ones. I just never did it. So we'll get back to that. Let's get into the news, Chris. All right. Number one, Kaz Harai is officially retiring from Sony. Oh, no. Harai is perhaps best known by PlayStation fans as the longtime group CEO, president, and chairman of Sony's gaming division, which he first joined back in 1995, having previously worked at Sony's music division beginning in 1984. That was when I was born. By 2011, Harai was chairman of Sony Computer Entertainment, as well as a board member. In 2012, he then became CEO and president of all of Sony, a post he held until 2018. He was still in his role as chairman of the board, however, which he will now be giving up. His retirement begins in June. Not much to say about this other than that Kaz Harai has been such a mainstay in, so in the Sony ecosystem and yeah. actually a part of the meme factory of PlayStation. It's a little weird to see him go. Yeah, him and Reggie, they're uh, retiring. Yeah. So it's weird. We're going to have like new faces. Yeah, for new those. guard of people. That's weird. We're never going to have a Ridge Racer moment again. No, no. That picture of him with the three, two yeah. during play is like really awesome. Yeah, he's just an interesting OG, and I really wish I understood more of Sony's corporate culture. It being Japanese and it being so Japanese, it's hard to kind of get a grasp for it. But these guys are all businessmen that have been with the same company for a long period of time, and they just come and go. And he's just the next guy in line, I guess, to go. But 
I often wonder, like, he's going to retire. I, I wonder, it's like, does he want to? Is he excited about retiring? I don't know. I'd be excited to retire personally. But. Yeah. I, I don't know. I wonder what, what's the culture around retirement over there. That's they have this thing. thing in Japan called, win, I don't know the Japanese term for it, but it's called window facing job where like when a person, they they don't really have a culture of firing and layoffs there. Even yeah. if a company's doing poorly, they'll like go down with the ship. And they have this thing called window facing jobs where a person gets older or more useless and they basically just give them a desk with a window and like just, they just kind of ride out, you know, the whole term of like salary man and stuff like that in Japan. Yeah. There's a whole different work culture there. So that might be part of it too. Number two, lost in the crush of PSVR announcements at last week's very first State of Play stream were some figures buried in a PlayStation blog post revealing PSVR's newest sales numbers. As of March 3rd, PlayStation VR has sold 4.2 million units, placing it well ahead of any of its competitors. Nearly one in 20 PS4 owners own a PSVR headset, which doesn't seem great, but is perhaps slanted by PS4's meteoric standalone sales. We had last heard of PlayStation VR sales figures in August of last year upon reaching 3 million sold. This means that PSVR, having launched back in October of 2016, might be picking up some steam, albeit of a limited variety. So it seems like actually PSVR sales are picking up, which is uh, that's interesting. Super interesting. Craig McGuire wrote into us on Patreon. Chris, he says, just curious if you think Sony are flogging a dead horse with VR. I tried it. It was unique and cool experience, but it made me sick and isn't something I could see my, myself playing for more than 30 minutes at a time or even want to play at all with a family and already limited time for traditional games. I realize in a vacuum compared to other VR units, it's doing relatively well, but just over 4 million sales in two and a half years, reaching less than 5% of PS4s out there, it's had significantly less traction than the motion control craze of last gen. Am I simply just not recognizing what is clearly the future of gaming, or can it be a viable additional experience? I just couldn't contain my utter disappointment at seeing Iron Man be a damn on-rails VR game. I went from 10 to 0 on the hype scale. And that was a disappointing. Of <laughs> that was such a promising concept that immediately fell just so quick. Yeah, it seems like it's like that Until Dawn Rush of Blood game that's also on rails. Yeah. It seems like maybe a similar kind of experience. How do you feel about this, Chris? The idea that even at 4.2 million units sold and a 1 in 20 attach rate, which isn't great, there are games with substantially better attach rates, many games on PS4 yeah. that have better substantially, uh, substantially better attach rates. Is Craig right that this isn't really worth the time? For me, it seems like with the uptick in sales, that seems like an optimistic, although a slightly optimistic kind of uh, indicator that maybe this is good for what Sony is trying to uh, to do with VR. I don't know if they're flogging a dead horse. I think the t I think making that technology af as affordable as it possibly can be, which seems to be what's that seems to be what they're going for because they're not really putting out these sixteen hundred dollar VR units. They're putting them out like what are they like two fifty? Like the barrier for entry is like getting lower and lower. I, I do I still think VR as a general kind of method of playing games is still too tedious for the majority of people to really give a genuine shot. Because I have two VR units at home. I have a Vive and I have a PS VR. And I've not plugged in either of them in a while. Not necessarily because I don't want to. I would love to play Beat Saber again, but I got a new PC and I just don't feel like <laughs> just don't feel like setting it up on the new PC. And it really is just that the commitment of setting things up and clearing the room and just like, it's so much easier to just turn the TV on and play Sekiro where I'm at immediately and not have to prep the room for it. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I think the future of VR is probably in arcades hmm. or maybe uh, augmented reality. I think VR as like a consumer thing is still probably going to, it's probably going to be a luxury thing for a lot of people. Not necessarily because the price of VR is so high, but because just the demand of what you would need to actually get the most out of it. Like, I feel like you need a whole room for it. It's true. AR is interesting because Sony is not really investing, it seems, in AR. While, well, they have AR games. They had AR games on Vita and PSP. Yeah, yeah. And even PS3. I mean, Pokemon Go is huge. Right. Still, somehow. I, I am baffled by it. But exactly. And Microsoft's also investing heavily in AR. So. Yeah, with HoloLens and all that stuff. So that is interesting. I don't know. I, I'm kind of with you. What's interesting about VR to me, PSVR, is that... Sony can't really take advantage of it in its home market. And I mean that because like a third of, Jap of Japan's population lives in Tokyo, which is infamously Cramped. known for its small apartments and all that kind of stuff. So people don't even have room in their home market to play these games. That's why mobile gaming is so big there. And so there's that market. And then there's the Western and European markets, like the American market. I think that if Sony's comfortable keeping this a niche product, then it's probably doing pretty well. What I read out of it that's positive for Craig's inquiry here is that Sony is not abandoning it. Like you would think this thing is selling way worse than PS Vita, like ever sold, right? Yeah. But they really believe in this product. I, I, I think that we can take from it, like if Sony releases something and they stick with it, we can at least make reliable investments in the product, knowing that they're not going to just throw it away, or at least they have no indication. And they probably spent a lot of money making it. So 
I don't know. I'm excited about these numbers and I'm excited about VR, but Chris is exactly right. It's too cumbersome and it holds me off from wanting to play it based on that. If I could just sit down and play it very easily, that would be different, but you can't play it easily. You we keep can't. we keep trying to reinvent the TV. <laughs> And you're like we keep trying to reinvent the the monitor, like it's a 3D TV now. It's curved. It's it's whatever. And I still go back to the rectangle, right? Because it works. It's in, there's nothing wrong about. It. I've never once thought, gee, I wish, I wish my TV or monitor was better in any way. It works entirely as I would want it to work. And I think most people probably feel the same way. And they don't need necessarily like to have a VR unit glued to their face to enjoy something. So it's just a hard sell for a lot of people. Definitely. And Craig, per your point, you didn't like it because you were getting sick and stuff. That's something that does happen to, a, I think, a like a demonstrable portion of the audience, whether it's like five or 10 percent. So you might also just be one of the people that can't play it. I think that's a developer thing, honestly, because there are some games that I play that have definitely like made me sick. But like Moss is fantastic. Beat Saber, as quick and exhaustive as it is, is fantastic. Doesn't get you sick, even though it's arguably is the one that probably should the most. But there are some games that are just nauseating to look at. And I, I feel like it is most that that whole sickness angle. I think that is more or more of a developer thing than it is the tech. Interesting. Yeah. And the resolutions are low, too. So it's just it looks yeah. grainy and bad. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Number three, Sony has revealed the free games. Active PlayStation Plus subscribers will be able to download during the month of April. By the time you hear this podcast, they should be available for you to grab. The two free games this month are Conan Exiles and The Surge. Conan Exiles launched not even a year ago and is an action survival game. The Surge, on the other hand, is a sci-fi themed action RPG. I've heard really good things about The Surge. I've I don't heard, know. If, I've heard interesting things about it, too. Yeah, it looks like, like a middle market game. Yeah, it's supposed to be like a middle market loop grind action RPG in a sci-fi setting. That sounds awful, what you just said. I think it sounds cool, personally. Like, that sounds I, like I, everything that's come out Yeah, in, that's true. for a while. I, I don't even want to like it. Remi- the box art reminded me of Vanquish a little bit. It does, the game doesn't look yeah, like yeah. Vanquish. I know what you mean. It's in that vein. Yeah. So... I'm excited to play it. I actually almost bought that game a few months ago. So this is one of those serendipitous things. Uh, I just wrote here too. remember, even if you don't intend on playing them now, you should still add these games to your download list via the PlayStation Store. So if you change your mind later, you have an an active PS Plus account, you can still play them. So this is something, again, I'll keep beating it every month. Just Well, I'll keep beating it every day, but I'll keep beating this (laughs) point every month that even if you have a PS Plus account and you're not playing these games, you should just add them to your download list. You just get 24 free games a year. So you might as well just add them to your list. Why not? Yeah, for sure. want to play them later. Number four, Sony is shutting down the servers for its PS4 exclusive racing game Drive Club in 2020 and will be delisting it entirely from PlayStation Network later this year. Word comes by way of Sony, which confirmed that Drive Club will no longer be playable in any online capacity beginning on March 31st of 2020, while you won't even be able to purchase the game at all from its digital storefront beginning on August 31st of 2019. As you'll recall, Drive Club had a tortured development cycle and rollout and never quite quite found its footing, though it did have a fan base. The game was developed by Sony-owned Evolution Studios, the team behind MotorStorm, and it was originally slated as a PS4 launch game. However, it missed launch as well as the launch window and didn't come out until nearly a year later in October of 2014. When it did launch, it was broken and remained so for many players for a long time. Evolution eventually largely fixed the game, but once it did, Sony pulled the plug, shuttering the studio in 2016. Jonathan Thomas wrote into us about this on Patreon. Chris, he says, greetings, Colin and Chris. With the moves Sony has been making recently, I think they are being viewed for their arrogance again. Between the lackluster state of play, which I think was fine, but they could, they should have set expectations announcing it would be a heavy focus on PSVR. The recent announcement that they will be shutting down the servers for Drive Club, the lack of pusher marketing for PS Now and Xbox and now Google are leading the conversation of game streaming. PlayStation is rarely mentioned in these articles. Then over the course of this generation, we have seen Sony laugh off crossplay, the PS1 Classic, last year's E3, and other examples that I'm sure I am missing. This has me concerned that PlayStation is going to make some boneheaded moves moving into the next generation. Do you think Sony is still in a good position moving forward, or do they have a lot of ground to make up regarding public views? This is interesting because what is the purpose of stopping Drive Club from being played online? How much is that really costing them? You know, remember, Drive Club was a there was a PlayStation Plus exclusive version of Drive Club. Drive Club was all about being online in your clubs. They made a big deal about this game. I understand it didn't work out, but like how much money could it possibly cost? To keep these servers live. Someone had made a good point on a video or somewhere I read where you can go and play Gears of War on Xbox 360 right now. That game came out in 2006. I assume not many people play the original Gears of War compared to other games. There's still people playing Halo Reach on the original 360. I could still find games on that. That's wild. Is this a sign, Chris, that Sony is becoming a little tone deaf? Uh, I really am getting increasingly concerned with their decisions. Maybe I... I think what's more telling about it is how many success stories we've seen of games that have launched in completely broken states that have then turned themselves around and how that's not the case here. I think that's more interesting 
because we've seen it happen with uh, Rainbow Six Siege and No Man's Sky and who maybe Anthem, <laughs> maybe. And the fact that they're not willing to, I guess the studio's gone. So I guess there's nobody to take the reins of it to maybe make sure it works for the people. I mean, the Master Chief Collection is another thing. That was a disaster. That was like honestly probably the worst launch of like the decade. And they, they managed to turn that around. So the fact that they can't have some team manage this game for the people who play it. Sure, what's the fan base like for that game? Though? I think the game sold at least several million copies. I, I mean, there's got to sure. be, be more people playing that than there are people playing Gears of War 1. Like, I, I, yeah. I'd be shocked at the, to find out that it's the opposite. But yeah, it's very strange. I, I really just question the wisdom of shutting down these servers at all, because I just can't imagine it costs that much money. Like, how much does it really cost to just have one person just monitoring this or whatever? Or, like, that, sometimes. That tells me that that game's got to be insanely broken, like, broken beyond, <laughs> beyond even human comprehension, or that they're a little bit out of touch. Yeah, maybe a it's little one bit of, of those. Both. It's one of those two. Although I do say, or I, or I will say that when I bring up Drive Club, people are really quick every time to say, like, you're really harsh on this game and it's a great game and people love it and stuff. And I'm like, clearly that's not the case. There was an interesting video someone put up. I guess he does this sometimes, some YouTuber, where he goes into old games to see if they're still populated with players. I don't remember the guy's name, but he actually went into a bunch of Vita games and found even like guys playing kill zone guys playing resistance guys playing freedom wars and need for speed and all this shit yeah they keep that stuff open this is closed down they closed down the tomorrow children they closed down kill strain they're closing down drawn to death before we were talking about how in supporting psvr sony shows that they're going to support things even if they don't do great for the long run but this shows the exact opposite that yeah. like these games are ephemeral and it does feed into this whole digital thing about our games like these digital games will no you will no longer be able to buy drive club by the end of the summer. Yeah, it's just lost to time. So you can have a hard copy of it. But yeah, I understand. I'm becoming more sympathetic, I should say, with people's arguments that we should be a little bit more concerned about the ephemeral nature of these digital ecosystems. I am becoming much more in line with that view as time goes on. That's proving to be right. Number five, in case you're curious, yes, Borderlands 3 is real. As predictably revealed at the Gearbox PAX East panel. Did you go to this panel? No, I landed right when it started. Okay. The game will be published I watched by, it. by 2K Games, but neither Gearbox nor 2K have yet revealed so much as its target platform or its release year, though there, there's a trailer. The other Borderlands-related rumors were also true. The original Borderlands is coming to PlayStation 4, and it's coming in hot. By the time you hear this podcast on free feeds, the game will be available for you to purchase. The so-called Borderlands Game of the Year edition brings with it the original game as well as all of its DLC and some in-game tweaks too, like a better mini-map and inventory improvements. The final boss has also been significantly altered. While owners of Borderlands on Steam get this version for free, you'll have to buy it again on PS4 even if you already own it on PlayStation 3. Finally, Borderlands 2 VR is getting a free update this summer that will bring all Borderlands 2 DLC to the PSVR version of the game at no extra cost. Now, there is an extra wrinkle to this before we get into the questions, comments, concerns about this. Today on Twitter, the official Borderlands Twitter account apparently tweeted out something about the date, like get excited for September 13th or something like that, then deleted it. Again, because of the April Fool's thing, who knows? September 13th is a Friday. Borderlands 3 might be coming out on September 13th. I don't know that I would take it as that, but uh, there it is. Nonetheless, yeah. it's, 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 it exists. Now, you said you watched the panel. I did. Excellent. <laughs> Nick wrote into us on Patreon like you guys can and said, why is Randy Pitchford so blasé? The Gearbox panel at the Prime was an absolute joke. More than half their time was spent on UI improvements for previous games and no meaningf meaningful details about Borderlands 3. Would this trailer have been better served at a direct style announcement or a spot on Microsoft's E3 stage? And Teddy Tags wrote in with a similar inquiry. He says, hello, C squared. While the Gearbox presentation at PAX had a lot of technical hip hiccups while showing videos, the trailer for Borderlands 3 looked great and crazy as ever. What are both of your thoughts on if the Borderlands 3 can compete with other looter shooters slash games as a service now that everyone and their mother has been releasing them? From the trailer, although it looked good, I got the impression that the graphics are slightly outdated along with the format. So let's start with the first thing, the actual presentation. I didn't watch it. <laughs> I heard a lot about it. What did you think about it? Was it was a disaster. It was awful. It did not need, you didn't need a full hour for that at all. Not even slightly. He did like magic tricks. He did car tricks. Every trailer that they showed or anything that was like gameplay of anything uh, or like a trailer of anything was like super jittery. And then they were like, hey, we fixed it. Uh, let's run it again. And it's still jittery. And then they cut it out. It's like, uh, <laughs> it was kind of a mess. There's no reason why they needed an hour for it. They even said at the beginning, we're, we might even stretch it out. And it's like, cool. They started it with by going over the teaser trailer that they released where it was just like a panorama of all the black and white guns and all that. And they were just pointing out Easter eggs like, did you know that this was that? Whoa. It just kind of felt like, I don't know, it felt like a screenwriter pointing out how clever he was. I, I'm glad I didn't go to it. 
And then what do you make about the game itself? I think it looks like more Borderlands. And if you wanted more Borderlands, then now you have more Borderlands. And that's nice. <laughs> I'm, I don't know that I would disagree with you it, at all. It looks, I don't think the graphics look bad. I think, I think that's the style of Borderlands. Yeah, cell shading and all that. Yeah, it looks exactly appropriate. I, I guess it looks old just because it looks the same as Borderlands 2. But I think maybe we're remembering Borderlands 2 a little bit differently just because that's old hardware. I'm sure that probably looks way worse. Then we remember it. But I, I think it looks cool. I think the, the fact that there's multiple worlds is, is is neat. I think the world design looks cool. I think the guns look cool. They have guns with legs in them or, or with <laughs> guns with legs on them, which is absurd enough that I would buy it as a, a pretty cool thing to add to Borderlands. I, I've just never been super into it. Like I, I would have to play it and get my hands on it to see if they've tweaked the shooting enough for me to actually consider playing. Because I like everything about Borderlands except, like you said earlier, with that other game that you were talking about, I like everything about it except playing it. You know what I mean? I like the humor. I like the tone. I like the style. I like the aesthetic. I like the concept. I like the variety of weapons that you have. But shooting just feels so weightless. Oh, it's interesting. I like the way Borderlands 2 feels. Although, again, to your point, I've not played it in some time. So Borderlands 2 is significantly better. Yeah. But even even still, it just kind of felt like it was behind a lot of shooters at the time, especially now that we've we've had like Doom Etern or, or like Doom and all these other FPSs that have come out since that have just felt so visceral. I'm definitely going to check it out. Because I'm curious about it. Well, it reminds me of Generation Zero in the sense that the shooting in that game is so bad. Like, it's so bad. We just have an expectation of the way first-person or third-person shooting should feel. And so I'm excited. Per Teddy's question particularly, I'm excited about Borderlands 3. I think it's going to do just fine, if not yeah. great. Just because it's a recognizable name and people really do love Borderlands. I think that it's a little late. You know, let's assume it doesn't even come out this year. Let's assume it does come out this year. It's been seven years since Borderlands 2. And I think that they made a massive blunder not releasing Borderlands, you know, not immediately going into Borderlands 3 and taking advantage of it. Because it really was a little bit ahead of the game, actually, when you really consider everything. It was actually probably incredibly influential on a lot of the games now that are oh, yeah. coming out. I don't know. I look at it more of as like Evolve or Left 4 Dead or whatever that game's called, Back for Blood. Yeah. But I really look at it as like a pure looter shooter. Maybe I'm off base on that, but. No, I'm, yeah. I, I think it looks cool, and I'm looking forward to playing it whenever it comes out. Yeah, for sure. Number six. A few weeks ago, we noted that Media Molecule's long in development PS4 exclusive Dreams would be entering early access on PS4, and now we have a release date for that early access launch. Dreams will finally be playable to all PlayStation 4 owners on April 16th, and as earlier discussed, will cost $29.99 or your territorial equivalent. The early access portion of Dreams will only be available in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, and isn't behind any sort of NDA, so people can freely use what tools are available in it, share everything with the world, and more without any secrecy. Better yet, when the full game comes out, being in early access will give you free final access to the final product. There isn't any VR functionality available, though if you are in, were in any of the Dreams betas, you'll be able to bring your creations to early access. Media Molecule notes that there's going to be a cap on how many people can get into early access, though they confirm that it's a big limit, in quotes. So basically what you need to know is early access dreams comes out in the middle of the month. There's limited access to it. It's 30 bucks. It'll get you the full game when the time comes. I don't care about this at all. I actually am a little intrigued by the release timing of this. They're releasing it the week before Days Gone comes out. Like this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not saying these games are never, never going to overlap, but don't you want to put all of your marketing energy into something? And Spider-Man comes out and then nothing. And then Dreams six months comes out, later comes out in early access. And then a week later, Days Gone comes out. It's kind what of a mess. What the fuck are you guys doing? It is super messy. That's such a weird strategy. It's not even a strategy. It's dumb. Yeah. It's just dumb. If anything, like you should have just gotten it out earlier. Or just held it. You've waited this long for dreams. Like, what is the big deal at this point? God almighty. Very weird. I feel bad for Bend, actually, when I when I uh, think about that. Not that dreams, I don't think is going to light the world on fire. I think you're going to find out how little dreams lights the world on fire. Yeah. But we'll see how, what, how it goes. And I, again, not trying to talk shit about the game itself. People like the game. People love the game. But I don't think this game exists for many people. We'll find out if I'm right or wrong. It's definitely not going to be a huge thing. Number seven, Wolfenstein Youngblood, the upcoming Wolfenstein standalone spinoff, will launch on July 26th on PlayStation 4 and other platforms. First revealed last year, Youngblood takes place in the 80s, several decades after the end of Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus. Traditional Wolfenstein protagonist B.J. Blazkowicz is nowhere to be found, forcing his twin daughters into action to look for him. Youngblood is to New Colossus what the old blood was to the New Order, an essentially full-blown game based in some way on the previous title while we anticipate the third game in Machine Games' reworked franchise. Very excited about that. Yeah. Very, very excited about that. Wolfenstein, Machine Games, Wolfenstein, Immaculate Games. Now, we've talked a lot about the New Colossus being way too fucking hard, which is a rare rare thing for me to say but I love that world I love the mild zaniness the mild campiness of it yeah but not really 
It's really well done. Machine it's Games pretty, is very good. It's pretty campy. It is campy, but, but but think about it this way. Like, G.I. Joe is one of my favorite things in the world. That's fucking camp. That's true. That's fair. You know, this is like Star Trek camp, where it's like... Right, okay. I, could, I see you know what you're what I mean? saying. Yeah. Like, Star Trek's really campy, too, but, like, it's... You kind of can get into it and believe it. Yeah. As opposed to, like, G.I. Joe is outrageous, and that's why it's good. <laughs> the same thing with Mega Man. Mega Man's very campy. So I'm excited about this. I think it's really cool. And apparently this really plays up the co-op nature of what they're going to try to put into the game with these twin girls. Yeah, I'm curious as to how that's going to work. Although I'll play it. You can play it by yourself and I will be playing it by myself. And hopefully it's better balanced. I still can't believe anyone got that trophy in New Colossus for beating the game without dying on the hardest difficulty. That sounds I actually watched a lot of a let's play of it, like hours of it. And I was like, this is fucking nuts. Like, because you can die at any time. You There's no... No, you're a squishy idiot in there's, that game. There's no way to spoof it either. Like, uh, what's a good, like when I was getting the message, when I was playing the messenger, and there's a trophy for getting to a certain point in the game from the beginning without dying. I ended up doing it the second time without having to do this. But what I ended up doing was like every 10 minutes, I'd close the game and put and send the save to the cloud and then go back in. And that way, if I died, I can just re-download the cloud. There's like no way to get cute in that game with it. There's no way to save. You can't save. Right. So I really find that quite intriguing. Like that anyone did that. Because you can get like... 90% of the game and die and it's over. Hey man, people, uh, some things click with people and they can just figure it out. It's incredible. I know. It's incredible. It's like that guy that recently beat Demon Souls, all the Dark Souls games. Yeah, every, single, every single one without being hit once. That's it, insane to me. And as far as I know, he actually failed like a few weeks before that and yeah. then jumped right back in and did it. So number eight, in a piece of very niche but relatively important and interesting news, well-known Japanese game developer Kenichiro Takaki has quit his post at Developer Marvelous, a job he's held for 13 years. Takaki is most mo- notable for being the creator and producer of the Senran Kagura franchise, games from the, which Marvelous began creating under Takaki's watchful eye since 2011. The Senran Kagura games aren't all similar, but they all revolve around the same thing, scantily clad anime ninja girls with large boobs. The reason this is truly worth talking about, however, is because of the reason why Takaki said he quit, because of restrictions in the depiction of sexual content in his games, according to the Anime News Network. Takaki has reported he already joined another Japanese team, Psy Games, which is best known for its mobile titles, though it's recently moved into console development as well, particularly surrounding its hit Japanese mobile RPG, Grand Blue Fantasy, which we've talked about on this podcast before. This is a thing that's making the rounds in more niche and smaller Japanese centric or fan servicey segments of the PlayStation audience. Right. And we've been talking about this, Chris, a little bit on the show as time has gone on about this increasing environment on PlayStation with not being allowed to get ratings and all of this kind of stuff. And this is really this is kind of maybe a canary in the coal mine, a dude who isn't that important to many of us, but is important to some people left his post. Yeah. Which is unusual in Japanese game development. Because of censorship. And I wonder if this is maybe the inflection point where we should start talking about this as a community more. What we expect out yeah. of our developers. Does this strike you as anything interesting? It's Censorship is always kind of interesting. Isn't it? I, I feel like this kind of thing in particular is a weird... It's such a weird conversation to have just because of the nature of what's being discussed. I don't think there's any reason to censor those kinds of games. I don't really think there's any reason to censor games like Hatred either. I think games like those will just fail on their own and you can just let them fail. And the people who like to play them... Just let him play him, you know. There's no harm in that, really, as far as I'm concerned. So I think it's shitty that he had to leave his post. We are paying attention to this. I know that this is an important thing for a lot of our audience. And, you know, something happened recently on Steam that I thought was interesting. That was an interesting inflection point, too. There was that game about raping women. Did you did you yeah, see this yeah. at all? And Steam, which is a notoriously libertarian marketplace, like very laissez-faire marketplace, actually removed that game and created a statement basically saying like we can't allow this and i actually took that as a positive a lot of people were like upset about it on both sides being like well you shouldn't be censoring anything and on the other hand being like well steam has all these other games where are they going to draw the line and to me i was like well i was excited about this because steam actually drew a line and said like this is actually the line you yeah, know it's and pretty, like, it, like this is the, this it's not is a particularly line. hard line to draw either. no I, like, I agree I, if, if i had a storefront i wouldn't really want that on it either yeah I totally i'm agree all for you. like you doing whatever the hell you want to do but yeah, like, sell it on your website or whatever yeah <laughs> you don't need steam really if people if people want it you can host it and you can share it in any way you really want i probably would have drew, drew the line there too i took something totally different from that steam experience where i was like well like even in a free market there's a line even in the most laissez-faire market, like these guys really don't want to put their finger on the scale at all. And I really respect that. But they drew a line. Well, the market is still free. Like you, if, they, if they have to choose to put the game up. Right. Ultimately. Right. You know, on their own website. I'm sure they can build it. They can make a launcher. It's not that difficult. Every fucking developer in, in the world is making their own launcher these days. So, you know, the game is available to you. You can get it. 
Yeah, you just can't play um, it on that service. You just service. can't play it on that service, which I, I think is fine, as long as it's available. And whatever weirdo wants to play it can play it. Now, if we rewind several echelons away from that rape game, that very inappropriate and I think distasteful. Yeah, I think, the there's a difference, least. I think there's a difference between a, a, a rape simulating right. game and just like a game with fan service in it. Right, I don't exactly. think that's nearly... Because a lot of anime itself has fan service in it. And it's on Crunchyroll and it's on these services and people love them. Anime titties. Yeah. It's... The thing where I, I wanted to bring that up simply because I didn't want to make people think I was conflating that rape game with Senor and Kagura. Yeah, no, it's definitely not. No, at all. But it does bring it's a similar conversation about like, what is the line? And, and I guess I brought up Steam because Steam drew a line that I think is reasonable, like a line that's like, you really, you really got to push it with us to get across this line. And this game does that. Sony seems to be drawing a line that's much stranger. And by the way, it's only drawing the line while its competitors are not drawing the line. We talked about Devil May Cry 5. Where yeah, there's yeah. like even weird lens flares and shit to cover like a girl's vaginal area at some point. And listen, Sony can do what it wants, but I don't know why it's doing this. Sony was always known as the place where you could play these borderline or these crazy games. Right. Yeah. And that was kind of part of its charm. And I've criticized them for a long time. I reviewed a game called Monster Mon Piece at IGN on Vita, which is fucking horrific, like a horrific game like that really pushes it. And so we've had this conversation for a long time, but like Senran Kagura doesn't really seem it doesn't seem like that offensive. Deal. I've played some of those games. I've talked to X Seed about them. Like that's really and by the way, X Seed has been complaining on their side too, and the, as the Western publisher of these games, being like, "What the fuck?" So you know who benefits from this is PC players, and Sony needs to really pay attention to that. Yeah, because there is a small vertical of people, a few million people probably, that reliably buy PlayStation hardware to play those games. And yeah. if you lose them, they'll just go somewhere else. Xbox might be the place where they start playing them or more likely PC. So I don't know why Sony would want to like give those guys up. Who's complaining about some of these games? I understand if they like say like we don't want the rape simulator on PlayStation Network. I wouldn't want that on there either. But Senran Kagura just with some and girls also boobs hanging there, out. I don't know. Yeah. And also there's so much shovelware on PSN anyway. There was 29 games last week we read out. 29. Yeah. What if a game's like barely functional and just like on the stores? Like is that like a... Is that better than having a, a game that's functional but weird and has like anime titties in it? I, I don't know. It's it's that's bizarre to me. It's very weird. That line is weird. It that's is, what, that that's a weird line. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Their line is just so far in excess of Steam's very appropriate line, and Steam will take advantage, or some market will take advantage of this. That's what I'm saying. Is the appetite for these kinds of games isn't going down? It's going up. Like the appetite for Japanese style games and fan servicey games that has not subsided at no. all. And all you have to do is look at even Vita games like Vita still getting. I don't know. Sony's got to be smart here because they're they're losing the plot in this regard. Yeah. Number nine, a fresh batch of layoffs have unfortunately hit publisher Electronic Arts. According to a report on Kotaku, the company is shedding 350 employees, primarily in marketing and publishing. It appears that EA's development resources and studios have gone largely unscathed in this round of cuts. EA is also closing offices in Russia and Japan in a money-saving move. EA still employs some 9,000 people globally. We don't know the specifics about this layoff, mostly because it is in publishing and marketing, which is not something we would d deal with. Uh, but we wish our very best to those affected and hope they land on their feet soon. This has it's been crazy. a very bad quarter. It's been a lot of layoffs. Yeah. The shitty thing, too, Chris, is that when all these layoffs happen, everyone joins the market at the same time. and There's only a finite amount of replacement jobs at other companies. So yeah. we're losing talent. That's the beauty of even making games, though, is that your talents are often segwayable into something else and someone yeah. else is going to pay you more to be able to design. If you're a UI designer at a game studio, I think you could probably make a lot more designing UI for like an app developer. Yeah, for like Hulu or something. Yeah, but, you know. Hulu de desperately needs a UI to <laughs> That's really funny you say that because I agree with you. Hulu is a little mysterious to me. You know who's really clean is Amazon. Amazon Prime on PS4 yeah. is so clean. It's not bad. It doesn't autoplay. The search functionality works fine. I fucking hate Netflix. I, I don't even go into Netflix anymore. <laughs> I don't mind Netflix. It's just because it's like you. Why? What, what's with the autoplay, man? What's I think the with autoplay that? is silly. I, I th but I, I think those automatic trailers that the algorithm edits together are some of the most amusing things I've ever seen. Close ups of people's faces in situations that aren't relevant to anything. <laughs> it's awesome with the dramatic music. Number 10 is a new piece of news that we actually wrote up or I wrote up right before we started recording, Chris. It appears Sony's new refund policy on the PlayStation Network will win it some new fans. I saw this. As reported by Push Square, Sony quietly updated its terms of service in both North America and Europe, noting that if you've purchased a game but haven't yet downloaded it to your console from your download list, you'll be eligible for a complete refund within 14 days of the original purchase. Additionally, you can even get your money back for PS Plus and PS Now subscriptions after you start using them, though the refund will be prorated. 
All refunded money will be in the form of PSN credits as opposed to a direct monetary refund, however, so you should still be aware while making your purchases. If I had known this, I wouldn't have even started Generation Zero. Number 11, a Divinity 2 original sin-related spinoff has been announced, and it's likely coming to PlayStation 4. It's called Divinity Fallen Heroes, and it's a turn-based RPG under development at Larian Studios, the Belgian team behind the Divinity franchise. With Fallen Heroes, they're working with Danish studio Logic Artists, a small PC-centric studio. While its announcement notes that it'll come out sometime this year, it doesn't confirm on which platforms. IGN, however, reports that it's set for multiple platforms, all but confirming a PS4 launch. Divinity 2 Original Sin itself came to PlayStation 4 back in late August of 2018, having launched on PC the year before. Divinity 2, the original version, came to Xbox 360, but never to PS3. Number 12, Ubisoft has confirmed that it'll be at E3 this year and that it'll indeed conduct its annual press conference. Their press conference will occur on Monday, June 10th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. In other E3-related news from another publisher, Bethesda confirmed that neither The Elder Scrolls VI or Starfield will be at E3. We do know that Bethesda is having a press conference, however, making it even more interesting considering what they might spend their time talking about. Will Selfridge wrote into us on Patreon, Chris, and says, Greetings, boys. Hope you are well. Recently, Bethesda announced their E3 2019 presser, but today on the Elder Scrolls anniversary stream, they said Starfield and ES6 won't be at E3 this year. Since Bethesda Game Studios won't be there, what do you think Bethesda has up its sleeves? Rage 2, Doom Eternal, I see you, Chris, and Wolfenstein will probably be there, but do you think they have anything else significant to reveal, or will we know, or what will you know, or will what we know suffice for an E3 presence? Sorry about that. Thanks for making my law school lunches more enjoyable, Will. Thank you so much for your question, and good luck with your law degree. This is exactly what I've been saying. There was no reason to talk about these games last year. They did it because they were afraid everyone thought Fallout 76 was going to be their new direction. So they felt like they needed to say something. And this was a blunder, man. And I said, what did I say, Chris? Yeah. I said that every time Pete Hines is interviewed forever more about anything, they're going to ask about the Elder Scrolls 6 and Star Starfield. And I certainly would if he was on this show. So. Yeah. <laughs> What a stupid fucking move. I don't know. I, I, under, I feel like I get why they did it, though. Because so many studios just straight up, they do a game like that, and then they do go in that direction. So I, I understand the, the concern that he had going in, but I, I, if you're going to talk about games afterwards, at least just mention one of them. <laughs> just so at, le at least at this year, you could be like, okay, hey, Fallout 76 was a while right. ago. By the way, Starfield! It could have been even been easier than that. All they really would, from my point of view, Chris, all they would have had to say to satiate me or satiate others, I don't really care, is to say, like, listen, Fallout 76 is a new direction that we're just trying. We have main a mainline Elder Scrolls game that'll go back to more traditional roots. We have another IP we're working on that is very traditional. We'll have more to say about that in the coming years. You know? Yeah. What is the difference between that and what they did? Well, they Other than creating expectations. Well, they showed people, a know? really cool trailer of grass in the Elder Scrolls and a mountain. Dude. So Elder Scrolls 6 is first, right? They said. Oh, no. Starfield, Starfield is first. Is first which and is interesting to me. That's even more interesting to me than oh that's God. first. Oh, my God. The Elder Scrolls 6 is it's 2019. The Elder Scrolls 6 is coming out in like 2024. Yeah, 2024. Like straight 2025, up. Yeah. You know, like probably later. <laughs> holy moly. What a so that's what, what but he does ask what is going to be there. So I think he's right. Well, first of all, Rage 2 will be out by this time, right? I, uh, May, yeah, maybe? Rage 2 is May 14th. I was looking behind me on my desk. Doom Eternal, I bet you they date it there. We'll see it. Yeah. Wolfenstein will be there, I'm sure, too, with the young blood stuff. And maybe they even saw Wolfenstein 3. I think the big outlier is not Arcane, but Tango Gameworks. I think this is when Tango reveals the Evil Within 3 or a new horror game. And so I think that's going to be the, you know, if I were a betting man, that's the marquee title that will be there. They'll show Rage. I'm sorry. They'll show Doom. They'll show uh, Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein. And they're going to show what Tango's working on. I think that's going to be the big thing. With Bethesda Game Studios nowhere to be found, I think it's a little too soon to have Arcane doing anything. They just released Prey, Dishonored. Is that enough for a whole show? No, I don't think that this is exactly what I was saying, too, is that I don't think that there's a need to have press conferences every year. I they think they could have just put it on the Xbox thing. Yeah, exactly. This is a trap, man, because Bethesda would be so much cooler if they were like, you know, we're going to have one of these every few years. We're going to have like a big blowout, like the one in 2015 when they really revealed Fallout 4. That was a really great showcase. No, yeah, it was. And so last year was kind of not needed. And this year, I, to me, I'm like, you shouldn't be doing this every year. Like only do something when you have something to say. But maybe now is the time for them to shine because without Nintendo, without Sony, there's just more room. There's more oxygen. Yeah. So even if the show and also is bad, they kind of have to. Hmm. They have to do something. Like I think it's pretty obvious that where they're at right now is not a particularly fantastic place to be. Oh. <laughs> and then they seem self-aware enough to probably address that. I wonder if they will. I wonder if they'll address Fallout 76 in any way. I understand that it's 
still selling and people are still playing it. That new update's supposed to be really bad, right? That's what I heard. The, I, there's like something that people really hate now about it. Survival or I would uh, I would tell you, uh, but I haven't played it yeah. because I why why I, bother? Yeah. Now I, I actually when we got codes for it, I downloaded it and then I just deleted it off my console. I'm like there's just there's <laughs> I'm not I'm not playing that game. Number 13 is a wrap up. It's a pretty substantial one this week, Chris. Mm -hmm. The Division 2 is getting its first substantive update and it may be available by the time you hear this. On April 5th, Ubisoft plans to add a new stronghold, the title basin, as well as altered endgame content. New gear will also be included. A new Ninja Gaiden-like platformer, Cyber Shadow, is revealed and playable at PAX East. And while it doesn't have a release date yet, it is coming to PS4 by way of publisher Yacht Club Games. Did you see... This game at the show, this was like one of the games that people were really excited about. No. Dude, it looks so good. I wanted to bring it up here. It's called Cyber Shadow. People have got to go look this up. It looks fucking dominant. Like a Ninja Gaiden epic game straight up. And again, Yacht Club Games, the developers of Shovel Knight are publishing this game. So pretty interesting stuff yeah, no, there. I didn't see it. There's, there was so much there. There's such an insane amount of stuff. Yeah, I find those shows overwhelming. And I found those shows overwhelming when I had a press badge and appointments. So I can only imagine that I would never go to those now unless we were doing a panel. <laughs> yeah. If you're still playing Metro Exodus, you'll be interested to know that you can now download its new game plus mode free of charge via a patch. Cool. Website Push Square reports that archaeological adventure game Heaven's Vault is coming to PS4 in the coming weeks. That realistic RPG Kingdom Come Deliverance is getting a so-called Royal Edition in May that bundles all of the game's DLC together. That the official Olympics game Tokyo 2020 video game is PS4 bound. And that a new Sakura Wars game is PS4 bound in the West in 2020. Website Silicon Era reports that a new Sword Art Online game called... And I'm trying with this one. Elisization <laughs> Lacoris is coming to PlayStation 4 and other platforms at an unknown date. And that R-Type Final 2 is coming to PS4, possibly using a crowdfunding campaign. And finally, website Gamatsu reports that Overcooked 2 is getting DLC called Campfire Cook on April 18th. That adventure game Nurse Love Syndrome is coming to Western Vitas sometime in April. That the previously Switch exclusive Toki remake is coming to PS4 sometime in the next few months. That real fishing road trip adventure is coming to PS4 this summer. That PC RPG Torchlight 2 is coming to PlayStation 4 in the fall. That the Samurai Showdown Neo Geo collection is coming to PS4 at an unknown time. And that Bless Unleashed, the upcoming MMORPG announced only for Xbox One, has also been rated for PS4 in Brazil, indicating a worldwide PlayStation 4 launch in addition to Xbox One. So that's a really long wrap up. Yeah, wow. There's a lot of man, there's a lot of content. Yeah. Yes. And I feel like I have no time to sift through all of it. Now, Chris, we're at the new game releases. Oh, I have no agenda. There is, or I should say are way fewer games this month this week, which makes me wonder, like, why didn't they just split last week's uh, uh, good uh, Lord. you know what? Whatever. Who cares? <laughs> Chris, do you want to go first or do you want to go second? Yeah, I'll go first. Anger Force Reloaded comes to PS4. Anger Force Reloaded is an action-packed, vertically scrolling shoot 'em up uh, that plays uh, pays homage to '90s uh, arcade classics. This high octane experience is set in the 19th century human world, witnessing the outbreak of a robot rebellion. Oh, okay. Beat Blaster comes to PSVR. Beat Blaster is a high-speed VR game about shooting and running, where everything happening to the beat of music. Running where everything happens. I'm sorry, to be the music. An original mix of styles with each level offering new challenges. Far Lone Sails comes to PS4. Traverse a dried out seabed littered with the remains of decaying civilization. Keep your vessel going, overcome obstacles, and withstand hazardous weather conditions. Where will this journey take you? Are you the last of your kind? God willing. <laughs> Modern Tales Age of Invention comes to PS4, Paris, 1900. During the World Expo, an unknown force kidnaps the brightest minds of the century. Step into the shoes of the daughter of one of the captured scientists, follow the captor's trail, and thwart his evil plans. That actually sounds pretty neat. <laughs> I like this. Monster Dynamite comes to PS4. Boom! Bang! Crash! <laughs> Cheeky monsters everywhere. Place your explosives strategically on stacks of crates, scaffolding, and logs where the little crit uh, critters are sitting. Light the fuse and bring them all down. Just like an ex just like <laughs> a lot of uh, onomatopoeia there. Yeah. Power Rangers Battle for the Grid comes to PS4, a modern take on the 25-year franchise, showcasing stunning graphics and an original story. Pick current and classic Rangers and villains against one another like never before in three versus three tag battles. Test your skills online against friends and players from around the world for endless replayability. Endless. Presumably so. Sephirothic Stories comes to PS4, a Shendoa, a world protected by Sephiroth. However, with the power of the world tree beginning to wane, countless people have been transformed into monsters. Uh, with the world on the verge of destruction, an unlikely band sets out on an adventure. This doesn't have anything to do with Final Fantasy VII as far as I know. I guess Sephiroth means something else, but I don't, I've never 
Yeah, that's weird. I don't know my Latin or whatever I would need to know to know what that game comes from. Yeah, that's odd. Scorsery comes to PS4. Scorsery is a fast-paced local multiplayer sports-like game set in a tournament of mystics. Gain control of the ball, shoot it at an op at opponent's runes, and defend your own with smart maneuvering, tight controls, and powerful spells. Sword and Fairy 6 comes to PS4. Sword and Fairy 6 is an RPG set in a stunning world of Chinese heroism and fantasy come to life. Embark on a journey to uncover ancient secrets and slumbering beasts in a world torn by warring factions and deception while customizing your party and weapons to your heart's desire. Fair enough. Those are all of the games. It's not a lot. Good. And uh, nothing particularly interesting. I think that Power Rangers game is not supposed to be very good, but I don't know. I can't speak to that personally. What? Can, really? Can you believe it? But <laughs> otherwise, uh, none of these sound particularly interesting to me. Yeah, I, I'm not feeling most of them. Chris, let's wrap up as we always do or often do with eight questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience. Remember, again, you can support our show on patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand for early access, ex exclusive podcasts, and also the ability to submit your inquiries, just like Jimmy Champagne did. He says, Xbox Live coming to other platforms like Switch and iOS got me thinking. If Sony opened up trophies and allowed you to log into your PlayStation account on other devices and unlock trophies, would you be more, more inclined to play on them? The answer to me is yes. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Definitively. I, yeah. I think that's going to be a really big thing when Switch allows Xbox Live on it and you're able to unlock achievements. This might be Nintendo's way to circumvent the bizarre nature of the fact that they refuse to have their own endemic achievement system, which is fucking weird. Well, they're behind on the times with a lot of this online stuff. But how far behind you? Achievements came out 14 years ago and yeah. trophies came out 11 years but ago. But they were still using friend codes up until recently. I thought they still are using them. Whoops. They still are. I think that, they that, are. That's only, that only makes me more correct. <laughs> now, I think that they say that because they're trying to protect children and shit like okay, that. Okay, sure, yeah. But, okay. uh, you know, I, I agree with you, but this might be their way around it. But I did talk on my monthly Q&A on Patreon about this topic, about Nintendo. Like, if Nintendo Switch had it as achievement system, I'd play it all the time. I just need to feel like I'm doing, I'm playing in the metagame. I like the metagame. And yeah, without that's it, fair. I don't... I, I don't necessarily care that much about the metagame, but it, it definitely would incentivize a lot of players to play on it, on different devices. Indeed. 100%. Indeed. Xavier Falarino wrote into us and said, should Sony want to distance Ghost of Tsushima's release date from Sekiro? Seems like the two have very similar themes and gameplay. I don't know that the gameplay is going to be similar. The themes, I guess, are similar. They're I don't... similar enough that I guess you could be like, oh, interesting that those two are coming out relatively close to each other. But they're also not. Like, Sekiro is already out, and we have no idea when this next thing's coming out, so... Yeah, Ghost of Tsushima might very well even be a 2020 game, and if that's the case, then there's no... We have no idea when the game's coming out, like Chris said, and therefore there can be no proximity issues as far as I'm concerned. It's not like it's coming out next month. If Days Gone was Tsushima, then I would be like, okay, we have a, maybe a little bit of a Yeah, that's, a that would be here. definitely a weird call. Straw Hat Ninja wrote into us, Chris, and said, Good day, gents. Nintendo and Microsoft have both tried to give indies a focus in their presentations or even their own directs like Nintendo just did. Sony seems to be the odd one out with them lately. My question is, does Sony need indies in a future console generation when they might not be number one anymore? You know, it's funny, Chris, that he wrote in about this because Microsoft, of course, was really the first major first party to understand that ecosystem. Yeah. If you go back even to the original Xbox, people might remember that the original Xbox Live Arcade was actually a disc that you put into your Xbox and then you can buy games off of it with an internet connection. So this goes back generations. They understood first. And then Sony finally started to get it. And Sony had a little, operated a little bit differently, actually. The famous story is that Limbo was originally supposed to be a PS3 game. And the reason that it came to Xbox 360 was because Sony wanted the IP. And this was usually their deal with everything. Sony gobbled up IP. They owned shit tons of IP. And when they finally let go of that, they started to attract a lot of indie developers. But I've heard from my indie friends making some substantial games, either developers that have released recently a substantial game or have released substantial games in the past, that Sony really doesn't seem to care about them at all, that they have a lot of problems working with them behind the scenes, that they don't get promotion anymore. It's harder to talk to them. It's harder to get answers. And you might recall that Sony loves indies. PlayStation loves indies was like actually a shirt and a moniker and all these kinds of things <laughs> a few years ago. Yeah. So I don't know that they need them anymore because the indie marketplace is racing so far to the bottom that I don't know that you even really want a lot of these games on your platforms, but they're not doing a good enough job of shepherding the best of the best anymore. Your, I don't know, your Yacht Club games, your Drinkbox Studios, whatever the case might be. They're the ones that were there when there was much less. And so uh, from my perspective, I think they are losing the plot. Yeah, it's definitely weird because like you said, like the, the 360 generation in particular was doing so well with them. 
Like Microsoft was doing such a good job with them. They had like a summer of arcade every year uh, where they had these new like Explosion Man and uh, Super Meat Boy and all these games. It was and, awesome. And, yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was fantastic. It led to a really good ecosystem. And they had there was some, some of my favorite games are some of those uh, weird like downloadable little bits. Do they need them? For a healthy ecosystem, yes. But I mean, like you said, there's the, how many games came out last week? 29. You know, good Lord. We'll see how this all, I guess, adapts. I think Nintendo is really getting a lot of indies first. It's really helping that environment. But I think that the environment on Nintendo is just a little bit different. Well, yeah, because they can't really do much of the current generation third party. No, think about all the zeitgeists that have come and gone just recently, right? Like they no Anthem, no Division, no Sekiro. You know, they're not going to get any of these games. They're not going to get Red Dead. Right. No Red Dead, no Grand Theft Auto, n- nothing like that. So, yeah, it makes sense that they would invest more in indies because they need to. Sony doesn't need to as much, but I think that it inge- that kind of spirit engenders a lot of support that people remember later on. And and I think, I don't know, man, this is just another notch where I'm like, I think Sony is doing something weird. You know, like I, they're acting weird. They're kind of all over the place lately. Yeah, I agree. Slants Shalafanger. Shalafagner. <laughs> okay. Says, hey, hashtag Trillin it. Krillin it. Krillin it. <laughs> like the Dragon Ball? I guess. Krillin? Crash Team Racing will have the option to switch between the classic and remade music. How important are the classic music compositions of past games to the franchises they respectively represent? Well, I think they're important if it's a remake, because essentially what a remake is, is just like a kind of like a preservation tool, kind of like this game was lost to time. Here it is remade in a in an ecosystem where it's easier to download stuff. And like a, th- that file will probably be around forever now. Yeah, it's, it's a good preservation of like what the times were. That's that's cool. I didn't know that about Crash. So that's cool. I'm happy they're doing it. It would just make sense to me. I felt this way with Spyro, too, when I was playing the Spyro trilogy, that it would have been nice to just have the original games in there. Like, why isn't the original game just in here? You know, that's like the whole thing. If, like, you want to remake and reorchestrate, I think that's totally cool. But why not just have the original game available as well? well yeah. How hard could that be to just include That's that? one thing I feel like that Microsoft or 343 is doing really well with their... Whenever they put out, like, an anniversary edition... You just press the select button or what the, whatever the select button is on Xbox. I think it's like back or something. You press that button and you're back to the old game. It's like actually straight up the game as it was. And you press the new thing and then you're in the remastered kind of world. And it's like a blink of an eye that it's changed. I wish more remakes followed that suit because a lot of people tend to prefer the originals to the remakes. Whether or not people have problems with changes in art style or like, oh, bloom lighting or whatever. I know like I would definitely like if Crash Team Racing was a proper like remake and I could switch between the graphics, I would definitely t- just play the old one. Just because I feel like I, I understand it better. It looks more uh, like how I think Crash should look. But also, I understand that those games are significantly older than the Halo games. So that code is probably good. Lo- I don't even know what the shape of that code is. Or if it's even portable in, in that same way. So, I don't know. You take what you can, you can get. Sean Corcoran wrote into us and said, Hi, chaps. In my place of work, I have begun to increasingly encounter the term MVP from Minimum Viable Product particularly in terms of project delivery to customer-facing systems, with the emphasis of moving from traditional waterfall project delivery to an agile methodology in an attempt to become more efficient. I know you have talked a few times about the price of games increasing, but do you think as we have seen in the games as a service space and as the cost of development continues to grow, we will see the MVP games released like Anthem, he says, with the success of the launch, sales numbers, social media traffic, site visits, etc., then determining how well games are supported and further developed post-launch? This is a really, really great, great question, Sean, and I'm glad that you sent it in. So what he's basically saying is, are we getting to a point now where the acceptability of a video game is going to become lower and that the way that acceptability is then gleaned from the audience, it will then be supported and made better or not? I think so. I think we're already in that environment. Yeah. I think Anthem is that game, right? Like, I, I don't know that The Division is that game. I think Anthem is definitely that game. Anthem is half baked and half cooked for sure. I've never played it, but you can read enough about it to just know it's it's all fucked up. It's. So maybe that is the game. And now Anthem has Fallout 76 might be another example that was even in worse shape. But if it's sold enough, then they, they're they clearly going to continue to support it. This is a really great question. You know, how do you feel? I mean, do you think that we're in that environment? Do you think that those uh, Anthem is a good we, example of this? I think we've been in there for a while. Yeah, I feel like we've been in there since uh, probably since No Man's Sky. Yeah, No Man's Sky is another great example. Now, I don't want to say that I want to be in that space. I don't think that that's an acceptable space to be in. No, I, I think it's a positive thing that if a game comes out and it's bad, that the developers won't abandon it. But it is also, the game should have been finished in the first place. So it, it, I feel weird about this entire, this whole, the, the way everything is right now is, is just very weird because it just feels very Catch-22. 
the power is all in our hands. That's what yeah. I keep trying to remind people. Like we can't all orchestrate ourselves like a voting block or whatever, because there's so many millions and millions of gamers and everyone has their own preferences. And a lot of people are selfish and I'm certainly selfish with my desires. And so it's hard to like get everyone lined up. But if you don't want games that are half baked and half cooked and you don't want to get to the situation, stop buying those games. Will Han wrote it and said, hey, Colin and Chris, hope you are both doing well. Colin, what has Ready at Dawn been up to? I know that the Order 1886 didn't do well critically or commercially, I think, but they have sort of been off the radar with the exception of developing some content for VR. Do you think they could create a AAA exclusive for the next generation of PlayStation? It is obvious that they do have talent, but I'm curious as to if Sony will let them develop an exclusive for them again. Even if it is unlikely, I still have hope that they could make something awesome, hoping that they could have learned from their previous mistakes with the Order and that Sony is willing to bury the hatchet with that. What are your thoughts? Thanks for all the great content and keep up the great work. How, before we get into what they're doing now, Ready at Dawn, what do you make or what did you make of the order? Did you play that game? I played a little bit of it at a friend's house. And you didn't actually beat it? And I absolutely hated it. <laughs> it was honestly one of the first games that I played on the PS4 that was like, I'm. it, it made me glad that I didn't buy it. Because that was an early on, right? That was early on in the PS4 life cycle? Yeah, well, it was in. Uh, it came out in early 2015, right after Bloodborne, I think. Yeah, I, I just remember being so baffled by that game because it just didn't feel like a game. It felt like a tech demo almost. Yeah, they forgot to make the game. That's why I was joking around. Like you could accidentally play it for a couple hours and beat it. I think it felt fine. I think the world is super cool. I love how they fleshed it out. It ends on a cliffhanger. I would love to see them go back, but I doubt that you're going to see it. Now, as far as what Ready at Dawn is doing, for people that aren't familiar with Ready at Dawn, they were basically only making PlayStation exclusives. They made uh, Daxter on PSP. They made both God of War games on PSP. And then the uh, Order 1886 was their first like major release. It didn't do very well. They made that game Deformers, which came out in 2017. People might remember that this was a game published by Game Trust, which is GameStop's publishing arm. Weird. And I actually did an interview with them about this. It was this weird multiplayer game. I don't think anyone played it. I would be surprised if anyone bought that game. And now they're like totally in bed with Oculus Rift. They made, and I'm looking at the list here, they made Lone Echo and Echo Arena, which came out last year. Echo Combat comes out later this year, and then Lone Echo 2 comes out next year. So they seem to be getting that Facebook money. But there was this weird thing not too long ago. I'm trying to think. I think Sony gifted Ready at Dawn a mock-up of one of the guns from the Order in the during the Order's anniversary this year. And that seemed to be an indication to me that maybe we're going to get a sequel to the game. And I, I feel like that is a game. Maybe it's crazy because I've told this. I don't want to tell it anymore. I've told the story a million times. How many times I saw that game early, how fucked yeah, yeah. up it was. <laughs> it was totally everything about that rollout of that game. You could tell from a mile away that game was going to suck. But they do have something. It would be cool to see a game like that get another shot. Yeah, I think it's a game that I would love to see them go back to. But yeah, I, w- I would love to be pleasantly surprised by it. I think you would be. I think that if you gave them another shot, if they made the order 1887 or whatever, I don't know if Sony has the balls to let them do it or not. And I don't know if it's even necessary and it might be too expensive. And the first game is just not well regarded. So, I don't yeah, know. you got to wonder what the demand is for it. But Ready at Dawn is a Southern California. I think it's Santa Monica studio, actually. I think they were around here. I think that was part of the reason why they were making some of those early games, because Daxter and God of War were their early games and Naughty Dogs in Santa Monica and so is Sony Santa Monica. So they were able to work with them very easily, I think, on those. Brett Herman wrote into us and said, hey, Colin and Chris, you guys haven't really talked much about the new Mortal Kombat game that's coming out in a month. The game looks absolutely amazing and brutal. Do you guys just not like fighting games or is Mortal Kombat just not that fun? He's talking, of course, about Mortal Kombat 11. Yeah. Chris, I wanted to bring this up because we haven't talked about this. We can't touch on a lot of games that we don't speak to. But I wanted to know what you felt about this new Mortal Kombat game. We talked about it, I think, briefly a week or two ago. Yeah, yeah. But are you excited about it? And and why haven't we been talking about it? I'm excited to play it. I think it looks cool. I I love the tone of it. It looks silly and ridiculous. And it looks like there's some camp in it. I like the idea of it's like this. The whole story idea is like it's it's future selves meeting past selves or something. And I, I love Johnny Cage in it. He's fantastic. The fatalities look awesome. I just... I'm not super huge into fighting games. It's yeah, not it's not really the thing that I gravitate to. Super I play them. I play them because my friends buy them and they're like, "Hey, do you want to play some Mortal Kombat?" I was like, "Sure. You want to play some Injustice? Sure. They're great games. I enjoy them. But do I want to spend, you know, $60 on it and dedicate it to a space on my hard drive when I'm just not all that interested in playing it when I'm by myself?" Is ultimately where it comes down to just like, "Eh, you know, I'm, I'm just I'll wait for my roommates to get it." I'm not that stoked on them. Yeah, no, me neither. They look cool and I appreciate them, but that's as far as it goes for me. I'll, I'll play them when it comes out, obviously, but 
Mortal Kombat has changed. That's like yeah, my whole thing. When I was a kid, I got Mortal Kombat in 1993 on SNES in fourth grade for my birthday. And Mortal Kombat then was serious. Like the game wasn't supposed to be a joke, right? And yeah, yeah. I just didn't like it. I loved Street Fighter and I, I Mortal Kombat's fine, but I was just like, I, I never liked it. And, and Mortal Kombat has become silly and funny and all of that and, and overly gruesome and adopted into something else or adapted into something else, I should say. But I always just think back to my childhood days <laughs> and, and how bad I thought Mortal Kombat was. It's just something I can't get over. And so I, I just don't care that much. I like some fighting games. I like the fighting game community. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. But we're not going to cover games that we're not going to play. I assume we'll maybe get Mortal Kombat 11. Maybe Chris will play it. And when it comes out, we'll talk about I'm it definitely gonna, I'm definitely going to play it. I'm definitely going to talk about it. I, I do like, like, I play Smash Brothers and, and stuff like that. I, I, was, I was always more, when I was a kid, I was always more into, like, Street Fighter and um, even to a lesser extent more like uh, Marvel vs. Capcom and Marvel vs. Capcom 2 that like that style more than I was with like the kind of something about Mortal Kombat felt like there, w there wasn't much reach to my I, I couldn't do much unless I was like up in someone's face get over here yeah and I uh, eh, I don't know I, it, I never really liked it before but like I, I did I liked Injustice a lot and I liked um, the last Mortal Kombat that I played quite a bit but I just something about buying them feels weird to me. Ryan Herbert has the final inquiry for us this week. Oh boy. He says, hey, Colin and Chris, to Colin specifically in the knockback episode on the PlayStation 2. And by the way, we just released a knockback, knockback to my retro and nostalgia podcast. We just did one about PlayStation 2. It's very long. If you guys like the 20th to anniversary of it. Uh, almost. almost. I think it passed already. Next year would be 20th anniversary. When did it come it, out? 2000? Yeah. Oh, so the anniversary passed already. The, yeah, it was the, the 19th, 19th anniversary. The 19th, yeah. Yeah. He says... You had mentioned that apart from the part of what contributed to its record breaking sales numbers was the fact that it remained on the shelf for so long. Is this something you can see happening with PS4 or would this be too much to, or would this do too much to harm PS5 sales? Could the PS4 stick around as a budget alternative specifically for developing countries or places with high tariffs like Brazil? Would love to hear your thoughts on this. So PlayStation 2 sold over 150 million units, which I think is probably untouchable. I don't know that any console will sell that much again. And it's important to note that PlayStation 2, as I said on that particular podcast he's referencing, was manufactured for 13 years and was on sale for even longer and found massive success in developing economies. When PlayStation 2 was long gone in the United States, it was killing in South America, it was killing in Central Africa, it was, it was yeah, yeah. finding places to find a, an audience. I think it would be a major mistake for Sony to let PlayStation 4 remain on the market after PlayStation 5 comes out for very long. They have to let it remain on the market for a little while, but 13 years is like no way. That would mean PS4 would be on the market until 2026, and that's just not going to happen, yeah. I don't think. Uh, I think that they have to go all in on this new console and stress that like you can play your old games. It's not going to matter anymore, you know? I could, yeah, I, I agree. And also just because a big reason as to why the PS2 sold so much is, is specifically because of DVD. Right. And the reason that it was like one of the cheapest and, and similar to PS3, actually, and, and um, with the Blu-ray. But now people don't really use discs that much. There's not really like a huge there's not a huge swath of people wondering, like, what's the most affordable 4K Blu-ray player? You know, that's not like a huge thing on people's minds. Most people are streaming their stuff. Mm -hmm. Most people have Netflix accounts or siphon Netflix accounts from other people. Most people are just watching stuff on, on the Internet. So they're, they're not going to have that massive push behind the PS4 in developing countries either. So I don't really see a huge benefit to just keeping it on the market like that. Me neither. Sony has to thread the needle really carefully here because you don't want to interrupt PS4 sales. PS4 reaching 100 million, which it's going to really soon, is amazing. I mean, that's fucking nuts. Yeah. That means it's going to outsell the Wii. It's going to outsell PS1. It's going to outsell like all of these things, right? And be only the third or fourth, the fourth home console to ever reach three digit sales like that. So they need to be really careful about not stepping on it. But I think that once they determine that it's time to step on it, they got to remove it from the market pretty quickly because PS5 is going to rely upon people thinking that there's no other alternative. If people have an alternative that's really viable and PS5 doesn't seem that much more impressive, that's a big deal. That's why I think that having these cross gen games like Death Stranding should be playable on PS5 only. Like that's like that's what I think, right? Like that's how you get people into the door. If you start splitting your first party games up, which is something Sony has never really done, people have talked about how like there's Call of Duty on this and that. Yeah, Call of Duty straddled and all these others, but Sony games don't. God of War 2 came out after PS3 came out on PS2, etc. and so on. Beyond Two Souls came out on PS3 like the month that PS4 launched. So yeah. you you have to be really determinative and deliberate and careful with this kind of stuff and. Um, know when to pull the trigger and know when to make your money because the minute PS5 is announced and really starts rolling out, PS4 is going to die. I think that's why Sony is being quiet. Yeah. Just go buy. They want to hit that $100 million. 
They're going. I mean, they're that's going. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah they're absolutely. Who it. doesn't want that milestone? I think PS4 even has the ability to reach like 120, 115. I don't think so. You know, you think it's really going to fall off? I don't see it getting past 120 or even close to 120 before the PS5 is announced. Mm. And I think the PS5 being announced is probably going to step on that pretty quickly. I think they could possibly reach it maybe after PS5 is out because people are always buying older hardware anyway. But 120, that's a big, that's a huge, that's a fucking insane number. Yeah, we're going to see how it all goes. Yeah, could be wrong, but, you know. Since PS4 games will, sir, I mean, I am I would be shocked beyond belief if PS4 games were unplayable on PS5. I would so, be shocked and chagrined. I mean, that would be unbelievable. That would no, be would fucking be. unbelievable. That I don't would be, think it's possible. I, I, I would border on saying that it, it's impossible. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't think it's even remotely possible that anybody at, at Sony would okay a non-backwards compatible play. Like saying it, I, I, I'm starting to laugh as I'm saying it because it sounds like such a huge joke. It would be something they would do, but that would kill them. It would I don't be, that would, it. PlayStation would be donezo if they did that in this particular environment. There's no fucking way. No, I agree. So with that said, then there's really no reason to keep the PS4 on the market because PS5 will just be able to play the old games anyway. So yeah. there is that to consider as well. Yeah, now, they'll, they'll probably do the, the general thing where they cut the price a bit for oh, yeah. a year or, or like a couple of years. Yeah, once they announce PS5, you assume that maybe they'll do a concurrent price drop to whatever, 149 or something. Yeah. 179. We'll see what happens. Chris, we that's all I have. All right. It wasn't that uh, wasn't that big of a news week. No, but it wasn't. You know, it was a pretty long episode. Yeah. Nonetheless, I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself. I enjoyed myself. Remember, Chris and I are about to record a Bloodborne Let's yeah. Play that will go live very soon. If you're listening to us on free feeds, it is already live on YouTube. So go check that out. And uh, all of you out there, thank you so much for your love and your kindness and support. Remember to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand for early ad-free access to every episode of this show, exclusive podcasts, the ability to submit your questions, comments, concerns, and thoughts and ideas to the show, etc. And also, if you listen on free feeds, leave us nice reviews. Let your friends and family know about the might, the majesty, and the wonder of sacred symbols. That's all I have. We'll see you next week for more. Thank you so much for your love and kindness. Take care. Ha! Ah, you stole it from me. Greetings and salutations. No. Sacred symbols. Eh. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is fan-supported over at patreon.com slash Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity. Eric Alley, C.J. Anderson, Morgan Ashley, Sean Battershaw, Martin Beck, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, Mark Boggio, Eli Bosford, Barrett Boswell, Spencer Brand, Miguel Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Matthew Brousseau, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Dylan Burns, Chris Buston, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Will Caldwell, Patrick Carper, William O'Carroll, Brian Caulfield, Brian Chan, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, David Chestnut, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Gio Corsi, Nick Cottrell, Cutter Crow, Nick Cummings, Daniel Diamore, Colin Davenport, Daniel Delanikos, Mitchell Durkash, Knight Draft, David Ellis, Martha Emery, Joe Finelli, Eric Figgenbeiner, Fotios Frangos, Michael Gallier, Chris Galvin, Blake Garcia, Connor Gashian, Alex Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem Al Ghanem, Toothless Gibbon, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, Miranda Grubba, Tyler Harris, Kyle Hagel, Asa Haas, Azan Isa Al Ricey, Josh Yeager, Greg Julius, Anton K, Jeremy Key, James Kinslow III, Ryan R. Kittredge, Jackson Lastiqua, Donald Laws, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Mark Liberto, Lou and Ray Loper, Elijah Lopez, Colin Love, Josh M, Ryan T. Mandel, Peter Mark, Michael Martinez, Sean Mason, Zachariah McAdoo, Joe McPartland, Wyatt McVeigh, Dennis Meinchen, Andrew Mendoza, Christopher Middling, Albert Miranda, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Ryan Murdoch, Brian Nietzsche, Josh Netzel, Adam Nix, Donnie Nolan, George Anthony Nunez, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, Nicholas Perfect, James Perrone, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Jeff Pollard, Louis Powell, Lawrence F. Prokop, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Mark Richardson, Toby D. Riemenschneider, Austin Riley, Atenogenis Rojas, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, John Scholes, Chris Schaefer, Michael Shanholtz, Brandon Sharkey, Toby Schutman, Glendon Cole Simper, Joshua Smallwood, Andrew Smith, John Tabanillo, Ahmad Tamar, Joseph Thayer, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Tam Tran, Adam Van Kieran, Raymond Joshua Vargas, Michael Vecchio, Ogley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Troy Walters, Isaac Wassman, Damon Weathers, Mike Wayant, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zaniga, Hugo's Desk, Supershot ST, Wyatt Henry, Throw7, Infinite, Homeworld Hub, Mad Mock Media, Fabian, Mubarak, Sticks and Crits, Richter86, That Rescue Guy, and Andrew, Ian, Chris, Dav9834, Donk2015, and Gavin. I tap my chest now sometimes, like when I burp, till I get it out, and I'm, I feel my, my breasts are getting bigger. Does that work? Yeah, it just came out right there. I burp myself sometimes on my back. I can't I can't do that. I'm sore. But uh, now that I bump, you know, I'm, I'm used to the way my chest feels, and now it just feels like... <laughs> I'm I, used to the way my chest feels. You know, like, feels. you know how your body feels, but I feel like I'm, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm growing boobs. No, it's not a good thing. It's probably all the McDonald's. Well, it's, yeah, it's certainly, that's certainly a contributor, I would imagine. Yeah. 
also uh, severe in activity, like George Costanza. <laughs> Just a complete sedentary life. 